Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piscor. And today we're going to talk about Dave Cooper and specifically Weasel. Jimmy, we've uh, been relaxing our uh, wizard coverage in a, in a big way, so there's a good chance we won't get to that uh, Palmer's, the Dave Cooper Palmer's picks. So we'll just pick it up from there, man. <laughs> I don't know if there was a Dave. If, oh, there, if there was. was a... That was the Eddie P. era, man, because this is where I first discovered this baby ah, right there, right. man. Well, good. That's a good place to start, Ed. I think of Dave Cooper as like maybe three distinct phases of Dave Cooper's career. Uh, we have mentioned him on the show a lot in regards to Mailbags, where we see Air Cell Comics, which oh, was yeah. a Canadian black and white explosion company. Dave Cooper starts working there. I don't know, when he's 12 or 13, something (laughs) really young, and does a lot of those books. It feels like, it must be, I don't know, eight series or something that he has his hands involved in, uh, from Gun Fury to... Icarus. (laughs) Exactly. And then he graduates to North Star and does Puke and Explode, which you can see a cameo appearance of in the Crumb documentary. Don't ask him about it, though. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, also comes up in the Comics Journal interview with the man. Uh, (laughs) Pretty iconic, and for reasons he's not that proud of. But uh, after that, you know, like, he sort of becomes, you know, at this point, I feel like it's sort of his mature comics phase. It's almost like a wave two of comics, and he's doing a variety of things. He's working at uh, Dark Horse Comics, doing some, like, lettering, freelance lettering. Um, And at that point, he does Dan and Larry for Dark Horse Presents, which is around the time, it's a little bit after Frank Miller's Sin City, but in the Comics Journal interview, he talks about, you know, being paid like like Frank Miller <laughs> while he was doing this for five issues. Right. Um, you know, so he does a variety of these comics projects all over the place. I, I believe, Suckle, I believe, was a, an original graphic novel that Fantagraphics commissioned from him. Crumple was like a sequel to this, sort of unofficially, but it's part of a trilogy in his words. But this one was serialized in Zero Zero, which was a Fantagraphics anthology. So at the time, I believe he was doing these two simultaneously, um, both in different anthologies and kind of going back and forth as he would work, you know, do one installment of one, one installment of the next. But this whole period is is a little different stylistically than what you would see in Puke and Explode. This is the closest, like, this is the closest sort of gap bridging comic between puke and explode and his fantagraphics work like i considered him to be like that first generation uh or that post uh los bros generation of fantagraphics artists i i tucked him in there right with chris ware and That's dan Klaus and, and uh charles burns when black hole was coming out in issue form yeah you that, know, he, that he was one of those heavy hitters is exactly where where i would put him and I come to him later, you know, I get I find his stuff probably in 99 or 2000, something like that. So after a couple of these books were out, but basically Weasel was the one that really turned me on to him. And I viewed him the same exact way. Like, visually, he's extremely accomplished. And uh, after this, he goes into more of a fine arts direction, doing a lot of painting. He also has a big body of animation work, from Futurama to some of his own uh, pilots, uh, short films... So it was very season, accomplished. There was a season of that gimmick that he did with Johnny Ryan that came out about five years after you and I hung out with him down at down at Heroes Con when he was talking about just the germ of that thing and how they were trying to like get that place that that series in in Hollywood. I, I I'll never remember the title because it's like banana fish Mantis. pickle. Uh, a lot of weird words. <laughs> yeah, pretty fun stuff. So my main focus today is I want to go through Weasel, but I wanted to kind of provide some of this context and just show a little bit of breadth of what he did. And again, because he's so visually accomplished, you know, not all alt cart- cartoonists are kind of this visual. Um, you know, he there's a draw issue where he talks about his coloring method, his digital coloring method that was very important to me, and you see it on display in something like this. This was a strip that ran in Vice magazine or website. I'm not sure. Maybe both. It one was a or the other. back then, for sure. And uh, that, that he had co-created with Gavin McGinnis. And then Dark Horse collected, uh, collected this. That's kind of the overview of where we're at whenever we get to Weasel. Let's, let's crack them open, man. One last note on Dan and Larry. <laughs> Dan oh, and Larry is loosely inspired by his time at Air Cell with working with Barry Blair, who, I don't know, has a questionable reputation. I, I really can't say more than that because I don't know more than that. Exactly. Nothing's really been written about it. But and, he was very young working with this guy on books like, 
you know, with elves and things, and it was kind of odd. And so this is inspired by that that relationship and that history, but also filtered through a fairy tale lens. You know, it's not straight autobiography. It's just weird. Yeah. Uh, look, notice the lettering. I often talk about how great his lettering is, and he worked at Dark Horse as a as a letter. You know, was paid to letter comics, and so you see a lot of that. It's one more of those visual di- visual elements that he brings to the table, and you know, from sound effects to word balloons. It's incredible. Like his lettering skill is so strong. It's something that he grew into as well because the air cell lettering. He was right. he was trying some things and a lot of it didn't work. But uh, when you when you're a kid, the the whole reason to go to school in when you're uh, in a creative art form is to just do your shit work before you go out into the world, man. He he learned on the page and it's there for us to to see. Very very uh, attractive cartooning. And at this point, he's cross hatching everything and getting all of these values which we're going to see in a second in Weasel, but very beautiful. And when I was looking at this, I was trying to figure out how it was laid out in a comic book, because mm-hmm. this is a square format. Yeah. The comic books, of course, being the uh, two, three rectangle shape. So I'm curious to track one of those down and actually look at how these broke up. He, I don't know that it was planned. Maybe there's some extra art that's put in here in order to make this all work. But it looks really nice in the square format, so I am curious, like, what the pages, how they broke down. Hard, hard to find a book right here. This is this is why we're here. This is what introduced me to Weasel, or to Dave Cooper. And I think that Weasel may have been, I might have found it through, like, Comics Journal's year-end, best-of-year issues. And this was probably mentioned a couple of times, and so I tracked it down, probably at Phantom of the Attic. Um, they were always good with alternative comics and especially fanographic stuff. So this is issue one. Inside covers a bit of a table of contents because there are several stories in each of these. It's that one-man anthology format that we know from the great fanographics cartoonists. Yes. And, of course, this is post-Acme Novelty Library. And so you're seeing these production details, right? Like even just having an extra color piece of paper as like a title title page inside what is, you know, a comic book, this saddle-stitched comic book. And so this is the first and the main story that runs through here. It's called Ripple. It's about an artist who's in this unhappy place. He's a commercial artist, and he's looking to go more in the fine art direction, which is a little bit different than Dave Cooper at the time who wanted to do more picture books. Uh, this character is already a successful picture book artist and unhappy. So he en- enters a relationship with a model that he hires to do kind of like fetish modeling for him and gets involved with her emotionally. And that's the basis of this story. Me as a reader, besides the story being compelling, and it's not auto- autobiography, but it's kind of slice of life and it's about a cartoonist artist, so pretty easy to relate to. But the stuff that stood out, again, was the lettering. The lettering and the, and the cross-hatching artwork, it was like... This isn't a style anyone else has, and it's beautiful. Yeah, I think it's incredible. Um, this is sort of the early days of scanning in art in, for, for print, uh, because you could see that it's very pixelated. Man, if he still has this work or access to it, we could really use a fresh, uh, a fresh release, maybe a collection, and make that thing super sharp, super pristine, because it's a little fuzzy. Well, two notes on that, Ed. One, there is a collection of this main story. Everything in here hasn't been collected, but the main story has been, yes. and I don't have it. Yes. Um, but I'm sure it's it's beautiful. All of his books are beautiful. So I believe that's available, assuming it's still in print. The fuzziness, though, I think is part of the art. I, I think it's this really fine pen line in a lot of cases. Um, there's a little bit of, uh, I don't know if that would be anti-aliasing or what, but a lot of it is really like hatching and, and even more than hatching, like a scratchiness. Sure. It's pretty unusual. It's a, it's, a, it's a 600 DPI scan. I love this kind of stuff. Like, anytime you see, like, the artist workspace, and then you see, like, the artist pages within the comic, I love that kind of stuff. And this whole story is, you know, has that floating through it, from the artist doing little doodles to then more serious art that he's making of this character crossed with his commercial work that he's doing. And in this case, it's even, like the character doing the story that's happening. Right. So I love all those meta levels combined with a variety of these different, I want to say fonts, even though it's all hand lettered, but he would do different styles of lettering depending on, is this an internal monologue? Is it dialogue? Is it writing that he's putting on the artwork? Such great textures. And uh, the book itself is 
pretty interesting at this time period. It's a comic book, very simple in a lot of ways. You see the staples here, but it's printed in two colors. It's, you know, that's, the, he's not inventing that, but it's also not a common practice. Certainly not at this point. You didn't see this often at all. And requires some different preparation in your artwork. You're essentially creating two files that will then, you know, sync up. A lot of artists weren't that far ahead. Um, there's a draw from around this time period, give or take a year or two, where he talks about his digital coloring processes. So, like, Dave Cooper was uh, really on the ball with all of these different tools and techniques and ahead of the game in a lot of ways. You know, I mean, besides this, he's doing these oil paintings, which constitute the cover, and now he has shows, you know, in Paris and things of these paintings. So, like, he's working all over the place. All of this is drawn, by the way, with a Hunt 102 pen nib, yeah, it's including awesome. the lettering. And this is uh, all nonsense if you can read this through the screen. This is like a made-up language and alphabet and everything. We always fuck it up, man, but it's kind of like that codex, blah, 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 whatever the thing that one <laughs> art piece is called. <laughs> <laughs> Some K-Papers know exactly what I mean. And we, we have done this exact exact <laughs> conversation in the past. Yeah. Uh, this is His father was a doctor and then got into like medical uh, equipment for the Canadian government. And so it feels like that's a lot of what this stuff is, you know, inspired by. And he talks about that in the Comics Journal interview, like the stuff that he was exposed to, uh, medical books that would be showing, you know, extreme examples and weird cases and all of this stuff. And as a, a young person, you know how it is. You see that stuff, you can't look away. <laughs> so I think a lot of this comes out of that personal history, uh, yeah. being close to the medical field. It's it's cool knowing that because I remember back in the days of Flickr, uh, I was... A, I was uh, friends with him on there and his his dad like i guess he had some back problems from the, mm -hmm. the art that he was doing and his dad made this apparatus so that he could like lay on his tummy and like be face down prone and continue doing his painting and stuff not only that like these canvases are gigantic and in his studio i think either his dad or his brother they constructed this like hinge mechanism almost like uh like at, at like a slaughterhouse, like the hooks with the, on the on the tracks from the ceiling, and then the the canvases go there, and it just like tucks so compact against the wall, and you just like pull one out, flip it, and then start working on it. It was amazing, like wow. an incredible use of space. I guess you have you almost have to do it if you're working that way. If you're working large, if you're working on several canvases at once, like yeah. you got to figure this stuff real, out. Real estate's a premium, etc. This was one of my favorite features. Mm -hmm. It ran through all all five issues. It's called Television Program X32B, and this is the one that has not been uh, re reproduced or finished or collected, unfortunately, because I like it a ton. This one is taken from dreams, and then he doctors them. And in this case, this is actually his wife's dream. Um, so they're very strange, like stream of consciousness, subconscious, you know, they don't always make sense, but they're filtered through his cartoon sensibility right. into these like nightmarish experiences. I find them beautiful to look at and equally amazing to read. Like they're, they're pretty effective in that regard. And then some of his weird art. It's real fascinating, uh, in thinking about the history of, of, comics and, and cartooning and the different eras of independent comics we got so like crumb in his generation they had their idea of like what cartoony was and it's like this bigfoot thing but if you take a look at some of this cooper stuff you feel you get some like wood ring vibration to it you get like even there's that uh gary baseman guy yeah, like, yeah, so yeah, it's totally. like so it's like the people who grew up in like that 70s 60s generation like that later generation is like little boys like the things they were looking at sort of got perverted and filtered in like a very specific kind of codified way that has a lot of similarities between many many of the cartoonists it's interesting i love all this uh extra stuff too like the pages that are ads or information about the book itself or the letters page even those things are spectacular and everybody a lot of these guys the top level of these alt cartoonists seem to have this skill. You know, the Dan Clowes, Eight Balls, always would have these beautiful ad pages and stuff. Another vestige of, of you know, Robert Crumb, who did, you know, every every piece of the, of right. the comic. Right, yeah, this is complete, like, like you, this is 100% Dave Cooper, cover to cover with one exception, and that's Pat McKeown's No Escape. And there are a couple of these backups. We'll look at another one later from Mike Mignola, but uh, this one is one of my one of those comics that I got at an early age and was like, what is going on here? Because it reads in tears. 
And whenever a character goes up and down stairs, they will show up like on the next level then. And so it's this like weird circular thing going through this building of several different characters all on their own paths. And sometimes they run into each other and they go up and down and left and right. And it's just... I don't even know how to describe this. You know, it's not an obvious story, even though there are little stories within each character's sort of movement throughout the strip, but it's not even this linear thing where it's like page one through six. It's just zigzagging and up and down and you start following a different character. Some of it's penciled, which just added to like me trying to decodify what is this thing. Uh, and, this but, is, and this is uh, Pat McKeown, the, the uh, Grundle Warchild uh artist. Yeah, another uh, air cell graduate, yes. uh, you know, fellow Dave Cooper, uh, you know, I think they were both there whenever they were very young working and knew each other forever. McKeon is actually the person who conducts his comics journal interview, so they have a long history together. Um, but this is such a peculiar comic strip. It's literally one of my favorite comics I've ever read and it's just tucked away in the back of Weasel number 1. So I was blown away whenever I picked this thing up in every every direction, from design to lettering to drawing. Even the backup feature was amazing. And uh, five issues of this were published between 1999 and 2002. So mm, issue and a half a year, something like that. You know, maybe two issues in a in a good year. And uh, you can't job this stuff out, man. You really can't. And speaking of the two color stuff, like this one is is tough. Like I wonder if this is duo toned. Like Photoshop has a duotone option, and I wonder if that's how he's making this because it gets harder and harder whenever you start blending those two colors to anticipate what you're doing. Um, Richard Corbin famously would go in and actually work on his color separations, you know, with airbrushes and different tools and actually draw right on them. And I wonder, like, this I don't think is done that way, but at the same time, I can't tell you exactly how this, this one is put together. Right. And, and and that's just the end page, you know, like that's not even part of the main package. Whenever you buy Weasel 2, it's not for that piece. That's just some beautiful extra that happens to be in there. At this at this point in time, Jim, um, I, you know, I have done Fantagraphics comics. I know the pay structure, right? Um, at this era, there there were like these outlier patrons of comic art. And that's how these guys would make their money, man. So it's like, make every page count because that's True. that's going to be the the sort of bulk of your income when it comes to this comic because you know seven cents on a dollar ain't gonna do it yeah that's a good point and you'll see uh in that first issue he talks about ad art sales um so he is a guy that sells some of this art i actually have a couple of drawings of his on my wall um the lettering though again the lettering you know it's just really this is early days of me making comics and looking at this stuff it was really trying to figure out like what kind of comics are you making? What can you do? And, okay. and this just opened the, the door of like, you can do anything. Like this is a better looking comic than almost any comic I could have pulled out at the time. Definitely, man. And and it's funny, like we, we started hanging out like 2003, 2004, and I could see like direct influence on the work that uh, you did in that Pornhounds comic yeah. uh, with some of the background textures and stuff like that. He's the reason I started using a Hunt 102 again. Mm. You know, I, I had tried that whenever I was a kid, whenever that's like the tool that you're supposed to use, and I just couldn't make it work. And after talking to him, very generous guy, you know, I'm asking him questions that he'd have been in his right to be like, you know, go figure that out yourself. But instead gave me some, you know, like real honest what he was using and some of the tools and insights. And the Hunt 102, it was like, well, I love these marks. I got to figure out how to use this pen. Uh, I don't know if I ever, yeah, certainly never got to this level, but I was drawing with it because of this book. So here's where television program uh, X32B really kicks in is whenever it's the two color version. Like at this point, I'm totally on board. And I would say somebody like an uh, Al Columbia yeah. is another guy who really started using cartoony imagery within kind of a nightmarish world. And I love that stuff. It's such an interesting juxtaposition. And this has the same quality. And Eddie Table, the main character here, there has been an Eddie Table book that recently came out. Um, but there's also been a short film with this character that's available online. You can find it, I think, on Vimeo and watch it in its entirety. It's just a couple minutes short, but it's amazing. And it's like 3D and totally looks like Dave Cooper art, maybe more than these drawings even, because it's incorporating like his color palettes and stuff and his background details that you see in a lot of his paintings. And so uh, we'll, we'll put a link to that one below this video, but very interesting cartooning in its own right. You know, I came here for Ripple and by the time the series was over, this was my, this was the one I was into. 
But Jimmy, man, like that, like the homeboy shopping network, man. What's that menu? A strip, man. Show him the another stuff. Show yes. him the another stuff. So this is issue number four, and Mignola contributes a back cover to this issue, but he also contributes a background. So another, you know, all of these pages are just gorgeous. Even this is a bit of a departure style-wise, where you see him starting to color some of the line work. That was a pretty unusual technique early on. That was something I think is fairly common now, but not a lot of people were doing in the beginning, and it's something uh, that he specifically outlines in that draw tutorial as to like how to isolate your line work and then color that. So this is the Mike Mignola backup, and I wonder how much of a breakthrough this was for Mignola because this is following that same symbol-based library uh, alphabet that, as far as I know, is indecipherable. I don't know if Dave Cooper actually has some kind of key for it somewhere, but so I don't know what it says. Dave, Co Dave Cooper lettered this piece? I don't know if he lettered it or not, or if it was just like he had created this font and provided it to uh, Mignola to use, but it feels like pretty experimental stuff from the creator of Hellboy. Yeah, for sure. We looked at Amazing Screw on Head, and it had a few of these pinups in the back where it was like a character and then a, a piece of text on that character, and it's from around the same time period. It was 2002 as well, and it made me wonder, like, was this some kind of breakthrough in combining sort of text that doesn't actually say anything, but with the images where, you know, like you're creating a different relationship between your text and images. And because I see him do it in a couple of places around this time, I just wonder, like, was this some kind of breakthrough for that? It's it's so cool seeing, like, a, a, a sort of mainstream kind of guy get experimental in this way. And by the way, Ed, you had pointed out earlier about resolutions and printing. This line work is cr is crisp, like super sharp. Yeah. And this paper is just slightly off white. It may look white on screen because it's so bright and high contrast, but it's even the paper is is not quite white. You know, like it's just attention to very tiny details. And then more of this backup feature of nightmare medical equipment. I, I don't know what you would call this fantasy. Uh, you know, Set it's devices. it's the Voynich manuscript. The Voynich Manuscript is what we were looking for earlier. Uh, it, I don't know about that, man. There's a codex. It's codex something or other. Whenever I mention it, people uh, people will put the put the link in there. I love the combination too of like this organic stuff next to like a piece of machinery. Yeah, and it all fits. You know, like it's definitely of, of like the same universe. And then that television program X thirty two B backup again, totally into that two-color cartoon world now. And the stuff of nightmares, literally. It's, literally, you know, this is coming from... Uh, you could put this in the context of Dream Comics, the long history of Dream Comics. The, the sort of last vestiges of, like, interesting magazines was around this era, 2002, and there would be a lot of mags that would have this, like, kind of two-color approach where they would just, like, milk that for all, all it's worth, man. A lot of offset presses will be two-color. Um... Almost, I guess, like now risographs, you know, like some of the risographs are two color. So that's a that's an overview of Weasel, five issues. Uh, after this, you know, he goes off and, and continues painting, continues filmmaking, uh, has done some picture books. So very, very active as a visual artist, but also active in a lot of different directions. Very important we put some of this under the microscope, man. I'm going to just like... Check that off the bucket list. Yeah, he's he's definitely been an influential cartoonist to me. One of the first guys that I looked at that was really sort of designing everything, and you were aware of it, you know, like he even has like the, the Dave Cooper, it was DaveGraphics.com, but he would have like these little logo-like things for his, his Dave name. So this is the day, early days of, uh, you know, everybody having their own websites and Super kind of portfolio early. websites. And so I would track him down online and, and kind of see that, graphic part of it branded and that that was big you know it felt like that was a skill that you could apply to make a make a book better than all the other books on the rack and this sure was for for the brief period of time it was out there on the stands so anybody at home that doesn't know dave cooper i mean he's active online posts a ton of artwork i would encourage you to give him a follow because uh he He's beautiful. You know, his work is beautiful. So check it out online, and uh, you can find some links below this video to more Dave Cooper work. Should we get out of here and go practice our Hunt 102 uh, <laughs> penmanship? I have a long way to go on that, yes. <laughs> okay, favors, like, subscribe, follow the YouTube channel, hit the bell. We'll notify you when we have new vids available, and we're on that race 
to 20,000 subscribers, so, so, so make that happen. You can subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe newsletter at the link below this video. You can also find Cartoonist Kayfabe merch and t-shirts at the links below this video. Jimmy, let's bounce, dude. Give them the marching orders. Read more comics.